In this video, let's take a quick look at how to evaluate expressions or work with formulas. And you've probably done a little bit of this before, but I just want to give you an organized way to approach these types of things since this is going to be such a critical part of this course. And so when we're evaluating expressions, what we do is just substitute numbers for the variables that we see. And then there's usually some calculations that need to be done after that. And we have our graphing calculator to assist us with those calculations. So in example one, you could see here that I said, suppose variable A is equal to 50 and variable B is equal to 80. I said, let R equal B minus A. And so let's just calculate what R is equal to. And so an organized way that I can approach this is by considering that A is equal to 50. And when I see A, in this formula below or in this expression, this B minus A expression, I'm just going to be substituting in the number 50. And likewise, when I see B, I'm going to be substituting in the number 80. And so let's calculate this. R is equal to what B is equivalent to, and that is 80, minus what A is equivalent to, and A is equivalent to 50. And so we see that R is going to be equal to 80 minus 50. And if you need to, you can go to the calculator over here at the left, work with your calculator, and you'll see that 80 minus 50 is equal to 30. So we would say R is equal to 30. So now we have another variable value here. We have A is equal to 50, B is equal to 80. And in addition to that, we have R is equal to 30. And so as we evaluate the expressions that you see below now, we're going to be making substitutions of A and B, but we're also going to be making substitutions with R. And so let's, let's do that right now. And just to be consistent, I'm going to, I'm going to use my highlighter again. So A is, is, is my yellow one, and I'm going to be substituting in 50. B is this blue one, and I'm going to be substituting in 80. And my R value, is equal to 30. So whenever I see green, I'm going to be substituting in 30 here. And so let's evaluate these expressions. So A, once again, is 50. We have 50 minus 1.5 times R. And again, R is 30. So I can say, use the multiplication sign, or I could use parentheses, different things like that. So I end up with 50 minus 1.5 times 30. Watch this. I'm going to go over here to my calculator and put in that expression exactly as I just wrote it numerically. So I have 50 minus 1.5 times 30. And you can see that that gives us an answer of 5. And so let me just note that, that I get an answer of 5. And with this last expression that you see in this first example, we're going to substitute in 80 for B. Let's say plus 1.5. And my green R is equal to 30. So we're going to say plus 1.5 times 30. And you can see, once again, that we can plug this into the calculator to get our answer. So we have 80 plus this time 1.5 times 30 and we get an answer of 125. So let's, let's note that answer right now. So we get, we get five for that first answer and then 125 for the second. So I wanna show you this exact same problem but in the context of how you're going to see it in statistics. And so take a look at, at this now where we have uh, Q1 is equal to 50. I'm going to highlight this, say Q1 is equal to 50, and then I'm going to say Q3 is equal to 80, and we're going to do a calculation for something known as the interquartile range, and the interquartile range is going to be equal to Q3 minus Q1. And so if I substitute in the value of Q3 here, and then I also substitute, substitute in the value of Q1 right there, I'm going to get the answer for what the IQR is equal to. And so let's do this. And so we end up with IQR is equal to 80 
minus Q1, once again, is equal to 50. So you get the exact same answer. I mean, these are the exact same numbers that you just saw me go through. But I'm just trying to show you now what the expression is going to look like in the context of statistics. And so we get an IQR that is equal to 30. So let me just note that. IQR is equal to 30. And once again, I'm going to use my highlighter. And so that is green. And so as I use the values, or I, as I work with these variables in these other expressions here, you're going to see that this is the exact same thing that we were doing a minute ago. But again, it just looks a little bit different. And that, and you know, that's just because sometimes it really doesn't matter what variable you're using, what letter you're using to uh, to represent something in an expression or a formula. Um, and I'm just trying to show you right now what those letters are going to look like in statistics. Okay, so for whenever we see Q1, we're going to be substituting in 50. Whenever we see Q3, we're going to be substituting in 80. And just like we did previously, whenever we see uh, this IQR, we're going to be substituting in 30. And so, um, so we can plug our numbers in once again. Q1 is 50. And we say minus 1.5 times the IQR, and that IQR is equal to 30. And so you can see here that this expression, when we plug in the numbers, is the exact same as what we had before. And so this result is going to equal 5. So the only thing that really is changing is some of the terminology and the variables that you're seeing here. So right now, this example is just in the context of uh, a future statistics, que a statistics question that you're going to be answering in this class. So we would say that five is what we call the lower outlier bound for a particular set of data. And the upper outlier bound is going to be Q3, which is 80 plus 1.5 times my IQR. We see that when we see the IQR, we would plug in 30, just like before. And again, 80 plus 1.5 times 30 is equal to 125. So later on in this class, you're going to learn that if you have a set of data and anything is above 125, then we would characterize that as an outlier. And if you had anything below the lower bound of 5, then, then that would also be an outlier. Okay, let's take a look at example 2 now. So we're going to do the same type of thing. We're going to be substituting numbers for our variables in an organized way to evaluate our expression, our formula in this case, for what we call the standard deviation of the x-bar distribution. And I know that sounds pretty complicated right now. But notice that all we really need to do here is identify the variables that we have in this problem and we need to make our substitutions. And so we have this particular variable right here. You don't even need to worry about the name right now, although we will call that sigma in class. And when we see that symbol in our formula, we are going to be replacing the symbol with the number 12. Likewise, when we see n in our formula, we're going to be replacing that with the number 75. So the standard deviation of the x-bar distribution is going to be equal to sigma, which is 12, divided by the square root of n. And in place of n, we're substituting 75. And so you can go to the calculator over here and just substitute this in. 12 divided by, I'm going to say second x squared to get to the square root button. So we end up with 12 divided by the square root of 75. And you get an answer of this 1.385645, etc. And you can see that I've asked you here to round to two decimal places. And so if you're rounding to two decimal places, you're going to two numbers after the decimal point, um, and you're actually looking at the number following your rounding digit. And if that number is 5 or greater, which it is here, it's 5, we're going to be increasing our rounding digit by 1. So our final answer here, when rounded to two decimal places, is going to be 1.39. So we would say that the, the standard deviation of the x-bar distribution that we're talking about in this particular problem would be 1.39. And again, that might not mean anything to you right now, but it will at some point in the class. Okay, so let's keep going with example three now. 
So now we're going to compute the standard deviation of a different type of a distribution, one called the p-hat distribution, or the distribution of sample proportions. Um, and so what do we have this time? Well, we have p is equal to 0.2. And we're going to see that in the formula. We're going to see p right here and also right there. So we see it in a couple of spots. And then in this case, we have the end value of 75 again. So we're going to put that end value in right here. And so let's write this out and substitute our numbers for our variables. And so the standard deviation of the p hat distribution is going to equal the square root. And I'm going to kind of make that a long square root here so I can fit everything in. p is 0.2 or 0 0.2 parentheses, 1 minus another p-value of 0 0.2. I'm going to close those parentheses. I'm going to divide by n. Notice n is equal to 75. And I'm going to get my answer this way. So when I'm evaluating this one, it looks much more complicated. I'm going to try to enter it into the calculator exactly as I see it, because the calculator can handle this. And so watch. Let's go over to the calculator and say square root, I'm going to try to enter it in just like I wrote it down, 0 0.2 parentheses, 1 minus 0 0.2, close the parentheses, divided by 75. And notice that everything is under the square root in the calculator just as I intended when I wrote it over here by hand. And so it tells me I've been consistent, I've set this up correctly, and I get an answer of 0 0.0461, etc. So let's write this down. So we get 0.046188 and continues, but in this case we're going to be rounding to four decimal places. So I'm going to indicate to myself four numbers after the decimal, and then I'm going to circle the number that's following my rounding digit, and that number is five or greater, since eight is greater than five which tells me my rounding digit is going to go up by 1. So my final answer here is going to be equal to 0 0.0462. Clean that up a little bit, 0 0.0462. And so this represents the standard deviation of a distribution of sample proportions, which again means probably nothing to you right now, but at some point in the class, this will all make sense. Okay, let's evaluate one more expression, work with one more formula here, and then we'll be done. And so this is the type of formula that you're going to see when you're working with some probability examples. So here I say, let's find the probability of A or B, given that the probability of A is equal to 0 0.4, I have the probability of B is equal to 0 0.25, and the probability of both A and B is equal to 0 0.125. And you can see, again, the, the variables kind of look strange. You know, this is not x equals 0 0.4 and y is equal to 0 0.25. It's p of a, but it's okay. We can, we can use whatever variables we need to in math and in statistics. And in the context of probability, it makes sense to use variables like p of a, p of b, and p of a and b as as we have right here okay so let's let's do some evaluating now so we know that whenever we see p of a we'll substitute in 0 0.4 whenever we see p of b we'll be plugging in 0 0.25 and if we see p of a and b we'll be plugging in 0 0.125 okay so p of a or b then is equal to 0 0.4 plus p of b, which is 0 0.25, minus p of a and b, which we know is equal to 0 0.125. And again, with this, I would probably go to the calculator. I mean, some of you are going to be good about doing this in your head, but it only takes a second to come over here, say 0 0.4 plus 0 0.25 minus 0 0.125. And we get a final answer of 0 0.525. And so later in the class, you will see this formula being applied. And again, the context will have a lot more meaning for you then. Um, 
But I hope that this was helpful, just seeing that, you know, the variables are going to look a little bit different, maybe be a little bit more statistics oriented in this course. But you're going to be evaluating expressions the same way um, that you always have. And, uh, and again, if you get stuck at any point, maybe come back to this video and hopefully it helps out. Thanks again for checking this out.